influence what, whether, when, and how genes are expressed. And they really lay a foundation for development. So while we may not explicitly remember our memories kind of up till around three years of age and even up till five is a little bit shaky, you know, our explicit memories, um, our bodies do, do and our genes do and our brains do. So these biological memories impact our organ system, they impact our physical and mental health outcomes, and they really create a foundation for the future of your learning capacity and behavior. So all of this taken together um, it just really emphasizes how susceptible the brain is to events and environment in those first five years. And so when we think about how stress and how trauma and how adversity affects children, we need to take that into account. This is a time period where their brain is rapidly developing. Um, but there are different kinds of stress and different levels of stress. And so we wanted to kind of take a moment to, to differentiate because not all stressful experiences and not all types of stress are actually bad for children. They're actually important for development. So that normative developmentally appropriate stress um, can lead to, um, to growth and development. So it can result in like brief increases of heart rate, mild elevation of hormone levels, but importantly, um, it's essential for development. If you think about a child who is, who is learning to regulate their emotions, these stressful events are gonna bring them up and they're gonna learn how to bring themselves back down. Um, it is gonna help them lead to a lifetime of kind of emotional awareness, regulation, navigating new situations. So some examples of this would be, um, let's say a child who's going to the pediatrician's office to get um, an immunization. Stressful, but they have a supportive adult there, the pain is limited, and then it's over. Or a child who's being dropped off at a new child care center, you may initially see um, crying reactions and then they have a supportive caregiver who's, who's bringing them to the center and you have a supportive caregiver who's accepting them at the center. Um, going through the continuum of stress, you then come to emotionally costly stress. So sometimes referred to as tolerable, tolerable stress. This also is sometimes unavoidable. Um, and it, they're more significant stressors, but they're either limited in their degree, limited, they're time limited, and they also are um, experienced in connection with someone who can support the child through that stressor. Um, so examples may be um, having a parent who's dealing with a significant illness, experience um, being in an accident or maybe a natural disaster that is um, you have a caring adult being able to help support you through it, or even falling off the play set. Um, it's a higher level of stress, but you have a, a strong adult relationship who can help the child regulate, help the child adapt to those stressors. Um, and finally, we come to that traumatic stress, so the really that toxic level of stress. Um, and this refers to when a child experiences stress that is strong, frequent, or prolonged, um, and often without the support of an adult to navigate it. So this could include physical or emotional abuse, chronic neglect, substance abuse by the caregiver, um, repeated exposure to systematic racism, um, stressors associated with economic hardship. So when these stressors are coupled with inadequate adult support, it can lead to that prolonged activation of stress response and that can disrupt actual brain development and, and developmental outcomes as well. You can see that um, the picture on the left shows kind of those normal, those normal typical neuron connections that they're developing. Again, a million a second, so that's a lot. When you have toxic stress, those neurons don't build the connections in the same way. Um, and these are in really you know, important parts of the brain where learning happens, executive functioning happens. And so the more adverse childhood experiences that a person experiences, the more likely they are to um, have worse outcomes. And a lot of this is not new to, to many of you who've worked in this field for quite a while. I mean, I think there's a quote by the CDC who really explained it um, well to really explain why it's so important. And they said, these exposures can disrupt healthy brain development 
affect social development, compromise immune systems, and can lead to substance misuse and other unhealthy coping behaviors. The evidence confirms that these exposures increase the risk of injury, sexually transmitted infections, HIV, mental health problems, maternal and child health problems, teen pregnancy, involvement in sex trafficking, and, and it goes on and on and on to list all these negative impacts. Um, and they reiterate the cost to individuals and society over, over time. So what does that look like in Georgia? Well, it looks like um, we interact with and we engage with children and families all the time who have experienced uh, adverse experience or trauma. So um, for example, almost 10% of children in, in Georgia have a, have a caregiver with substance use. 10% um, have had a parent who have served jail time and 21% are currently living in poverty. These are all factors that when compiled together can create um, toxic environments for children. So fortunately, as Dr. Carl Bell said, and I love this quote, risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. So thinking of the data, it can seem doom and gloom, but it's really not. It's, it's an opportunity for us to look at where the risk factors are and try to buffer them and then look for where those protective factors are and try to increase them to be protective. Um, and in our kind of goal here is to demonstrate how infant early childhood mental health um, initiatives can offer a way to kind of prevent and mitigate that impact of stressful events on social emotional well-being. Uh, when we think about how to support infants and young children, and I, I you may notice um, what what's the commonality in all of these pictures? What's one? What's what do you see that's common across all of these pictures? You can write it in the chat. Touch, mm -hmm, love, smiles, contact, engagement. Exactly. In every single one of these pictures, the child is not alone. Um, and it, it really, really, we want to reiterate that, that we're never working with just a child. We're never considering just a child. We're always considering, yes, someone just said a caring adult, a caring parent, someone, a, a baby is not a baby unless they are with someone. Um, and so I think, again, as we move forward, we want to think about how we can promote that and how we can bring that forward, because that is going to be the most protective piece that we have. So what can we do to build in resilience, coping skills, and well-being for children? Um, so just as that developing child is susceptible to those negative impacts we talked about, they are so primed for positive development and well-being. They are so primed for relationships. If you think of an infant, the very first thing they do is open their eyes and look at their caregiver. They recognize the voice of the, the, their parent the second they're born. The smell is immediately, they are primed for relationships. And so what our kind of role can be is to promote that relationships and support them. So, so there's a few areas that we really look at when we think of infant early childhood mental health and that's strengthening relationships, reducing sources of stress and building those core skills to navigate these new situations. So this quote says, parents and other regular caregivers of children's lives are active ingredients of environmental influence during the early childhood period. Children grow and thrive in contexts of close and dependable relationships that provide love and nurturance, security, responsive interaction, and encouragement for exploration. Without at least one such relationship, development is disrupted and the consequences can be severe and long lasting. That one relationship, at least, we need to make sure that we're um, supporting it being possible with their caregiver. So a little bit more specifically, um, IACMH spans a range of services. Um, this includes macro promotion, prevention, and early intervention, and assessment and, treat and treatment. And each of these is equally important and do not exist in isolation of each other. So when we're thinking of one, we're thinking of them all. Um, so the macro level refers to those policies, the laws, regulations that support healthy infant and early childhood development. And um, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what's happening in Georgia in a second, but this is you know things such as cross-agency support, um, ensuring reimbursements possible, investment in those prevention pieces and training the workforce. 
Um, promotion involves the um, promotion of healthy emotional development for all children. So for example, programs to educate parents and caregivers and providers about how to promote social emotional development, access to services, um, education for families and, and providers, and really in, in supporting those, those environments in which children are in. Prevention early in intervention includes that IACMH consultation. It can help support and identify children who are at risk. It includes screening, um, consultation, behavioral supports, program-wide supports in schools. Um, part C providers often um, play an integral part of that as long. Um, and then trainings for families or caregivers or providers who um, support and engage with children who are identified as at risk. And then treatment are those specialized interventions for infants, toddlers, and families who are already experiencing, um, have already been identified as experienced trauma or exhibiting symptoms. Um, and so again, we're going to um, we're going to discuss how that looks in Georgia and what's going on. Um, and so what I'll do now is I'll pass it over to Laura Lucas from DECAL, who's going to talk about the specific ways that we're doing each of these areas in Georgia right now. Thanks so much, Dr. Wood. I'm so glad to be with you guys today um, and so glad so many people have joined our session. Um, so uh, just as Dr. Wood say, uh, said that uh, we're really starting some, some work in Georgia, really across the last couple of years of really building a system in Georgia to support infant early childhood mental health. Uh, so we wanted to share some of our progress and some of the things that we've been working on. Um, next slide. So I really love this graphic um, because it really kind of shows all the important pieces that have to come together when you're thinking of building a system of care. Um, and as you can notice, there's sort of like, you know, you have to have the big rocks, solid, solid foundation at the bottom um, with, um, you know, trauma informed, uh, culturally uh, responsive uh, trainings, uh, public and private funding into your soil, and then the roots of things are um, looking at relationship-focused approaches, uh, making sure you're approaching this population um, developmentally in a developmentally appropriate ways, um, and then that's really what you have to have to lift up the supports and services for children, families, and the workforce. And that word is very important. It's also about the workforce. We've got to make sure that we're supporting our workforce, which is a lot of our initiatives um, are, are around, which we'll talk about in a second. And that's really you can, when you can truly support infant and early childhood and early relational health, those important relationships that Dr. Wood just talked about um, as being a key for social emotional wellness for young and children and families around the areas of promotion, prevention, and then of course treatment. Um, so I just like to share this to kind of say, this is where we're trying to get to. This is where we're trying to go. Uh, we certainly do not have all of these things together, uh, but we are working um, to sort of fill the gaps and to create a system that is responsive to each of these elements. Next slide. Um, so how we got started in this is um, it really started with advocacy. Um, we have Callan Wells from Gears here, which is the Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. And yes, I have a sticky that says that so that I don't mess up the acronym. Um, but um, her group really advocated that we didn't have um, the image that I just showed you. We did not really have a system um, for the zero to five population that's responsive to social emotional health needs in Georgia. Um, and through that advocacy, um, we were able to get an audience of uh, legislative members um, that formed the Infant and Toddler Social Emotional Health House Study Committee. Um, and um, Callan and, and other folks really kind of came together and um, build an agenda of really informing and educating uh, legislators around some of the information that Dr. Wood just provided with you. Uh, we heard from some different states that already had some um, great initiatives going on um, and just about sort of that key sort of window of opportunity in early childhood um, that we really need to have more services and supports in place 
at that time and not wait. Um, I, I know many of you are probably have worked in the field and uh, maybe have even experienced yourself of a child being told to wait for services, wait until they're older. Um, and that is not uh, the direction we need to go in. We need to address trauma um, and um, social emotional health needs as soon as possible and as early as possible, just as Dr. Wood um, stated, that's sort of the window of opportunity for us. Um, so in the wisdom of this House Study Committee, um, they really decided that we needed some leadership around this. So they established um, two levels of leadership. They really wanted a state position um, dedicated to infant early childhood mental health. So my position was created and housed at the Department of Early Care and Learning um, in November 2020, which was right in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but I am still very proud of all the work that we have done despite the pandemic. Um, and the other sort of level was sort of the recognition that this isn't something that's just owned by DECAL. This is really working with other uh, child serving state agencies and other community agencies um, and representatives, family representatives um, to really come up with some plans and initiatives. Um, so we formed the Infant Early Childhood Mental Health Task Force, which includes all of these members, where we come together and really talk about what an early childhood system of care should look like and what Georgia needs to do. Next slide. So what is our goal? It's to build the build Georgia's early childhood system of care together. So again, I emphasize together because this isn't just a decal initiative. This is something that we're really pulling from um, uh, all the other child state serving agencies, community agencies, families. Um, we all have to come together as a collaborative to build that system. Um, and this illustration on the left of your screen is um, from zero to three. And I think it just does a really great job of just saying that no one agency or organization owns uh, the promotion of social emotional well being for young children. It really touches all different agencies and groups. Um, so I'm really proud to say that we have pediatricians, we have uh, child care providers, we have home visitors, we have um, folks from DJJ, we have policymakers, we have DFACS folks, we have um, public health folks. We have all of these folks involved in either our work groups or our task force. And um, we're just, uh, it just, it's a group effort. Next slide. So the role of the task force is to build and sustain a comprehensive and collaborative early childhood system of care in Georgia. And the way that we're doing that is promoting coordinated policy and collaborative service delivery, supporting young children and their caregivers to address social and emotional health needs, and of course, promoting that early relational health. Next slide. So what we did is we separated um, the, the task force into three different work groups. And these are sort of the three different buckets where the legislative recommendations sort of fell. So you have your promotion and prevention, policy and finance, and workforce development. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute to sort of tell you some of the accomplishments each of these work groups have done thus far, and then some of the things that we're working on. Next slide. So the first work group is promotion and prevention work group. So we knew that we needed some dynamic leadership um, at the helm of this work group. So we were so excited to have Dr. Terry McFadden help lead this group. Um, she is, of course, a professor of pediatrics in um, the Emory School of Medicine. She's the past president of the Georgia Association of uh, American Pediatrics. Um, and she also does a lot of work in equity around child and adolescent health. Um, so, um, and she's a pediatrician, uh, an active pediatrician. Um, so we knew that we wanted um, that kind of leadership. And um, we also partnered with Erin Harlow Parker, who um, works for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and their behavioral and mental health prevention area. Um, so this was just a really great dynamic to have these two leaders kind of help us think through how do we even start talking about infant early childhood mental health, sort of promoting the idea and then also looking at populations that are at high risk to struggle with mental health issues, um, such as kids who have been traumatized, uh, kids in foster care, um, obviously kids who have been abused or um, gone through toxic stress um, in their young lives. Next slide. 
Um, so one of the initiatives that we um, kicked off um, last May is um, really around promoting the role of the caregiver, just as Dr. Wood emphasized, relationships are everything when we're talking about uh, mental health and young children. Um, so really sort of empowering caregivers that they have a role in promoting social emotional wellness. And then also sort of getting out there that um, young children have mental health too. So we need to take the opportunity to promote that social emotional wellness from the very beginning. So Laura, if you wanna to try to play the video real quick, we'll talk about it more after we're done. Children are shaped by their earliest experiences and relationships and often communicate through their behaviors. We know that 90% of brain growth occurs before kindergarten, so it's up to the parents and caregivers of young children to use this window of opportunity in early childhood to create the foundation for social and emotional health. The single most common factor for children who develop resilience is at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. Will you be the one to show me that I am important? To teach me how to calm myself when I feel upset? To be there for me when things are tough? help me solve problems, to teach me how to be a good friend, to show me how to play with others, to make me feel safe, to show me I can do hard things. I am the one who can teach coping strategies. Help a child build self-confidence. Build a child's resilience. Provide encouragement. Show a child how to connect with others. Help a child be part of a team. Make a child feel safe and secure. Model self-care. Really listen to a child. Love them just as they are. I can be the one to support a child's mental health and build resilience. Will you be the one to make a difference in a child's life today? Um, so um, I love that video. I hope you do too. Um, and what's great about that video is it is free and available for all of you to use. Um, Callan shared uh, the video um, is located or, or the link with the video um, is located on the decal YouTube channel. And there's two versions. That was the long version. Um, and then there's a shorter version, which was very hard to make because I didn't want to cut anything. Um, but really using this as you guys uh, work with families, um, I know a lot of you probably do a lot of family groups. Um, please use this. It, it helps empower families, make them feel important. Um, child, uh, child care providers, teachers, anybody who works with young children um, should feel um, important because it is important. It really is um, having the opportunity to be that safe, supportive, nurturing relationship that makes all the difference in a child's life. Um, so please use that video. Uh, next slide. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wood. Um, so the other big thing that we're doing that I'm really excited about is uh, we started promoting Children's Mental Health Week at DECAL. So uh, with my position being housed at DECAL, we really wanted to do something specifically for child care providers and teachers. Um, and I, I think we decided like on the promotion part of it, we really just needed to let people know that children have mental health, because I don't know that that's always um, something that's accepted. I think our system is built 
for um, services and supports for older children and mental health and social emotional health needs. Um, so sometimes we don't always think that an infant or a young child or a toddler or a um, preschooler has a mental health, um, but they absolutely do. And we absolutely have opportunities to promote that social emotional wellness in every interaction we have with them. Uh, so we, this is for um, this, we are always celebrated on the first week of May. So this was the slide that we used or the promotion that we used for this year. Um, so next year, I see somebody in the chat box asked for 2023. It'll be the first week of May in 2023. Um, but we always use the hashtag little kids, big feelings, um, and then decal CMH week, um, and then whatever year it is. Um, but for example, some of the things that we we've done is this year, uh, we had a puppet show um, from um, uh, that really focused on uh, big feelings um, and how to socialize with other peers, um, which is very popular. Kids love puppet shows, and it's just a fun, easy way to normalize sort of mental health, social, emotional wellness and start bringing that into the conversation. Um, we also promoted... Um, uh, mental health uh, for the teachers, because that's just as important, right? So we did um, self-care gift cards for teachers um, to go out and buy whatever they needed uh, to um, for themselves, to take care of themselves, because that's important. And then we also sponsored um, one site in the creation of a calm corner, which is an area where a child who's having some big emotions can go to calm themselves down with manipulatives and um, emotion boards and things like that so that they can identify their feelings and um, just have a space to sort of regulate those emotions. Um, and again, not by themselves with, with a caregiver but that can help co-regulate. Um, so just be on the lookout for that. That's something that we're gonna celebrate um, the first week of every May. Um, we have a decal webpage with a lot of resources and a lot of activities uh, that are age appropriate all the way from infants um, to pre-K age. Um, and we're just happy to celebrate and recognize children's mental health um, on an annual basis for our youngest learners and their caregivers. Next slide. Um, the other thing um, that I always want to promote with DECAL, and this was in existence way before my position, um, but DECAL does have a SEEDS helpline and um, they serve child care centers, Georgia pre-K programs, Head Start, early Head Start programs, um, public preschool pro uh, classrooms and family members. So if anybody wants to connect with resources, um, training, professional development um, for child care centers or class pre-K classrooms that need some practice-based coaching, we use the pyramid model and we have um, some pyramid model coaches that can help you with just classroom practices, um, especially around addressing persistent and challenging behaviors. Um, so I always promote this to just say that this is a helpline that's here um, for our youngest learners. Um, and so please uh, make a note of this and reach out or share it with childcare providers or teachers um, that it might be useful for. Next slide. So one of the big projects that we are working on in the promotion and prevention work group is having sort of a hub where we have information about what infant early childhood mental health is, um, resources like these listed here um, that are uh, for each audience. So when we talk about early childhood workforce, um, you know, child care providers, teachers, early interventionists, home visitors, um, we also think about healthcare providers like pediatricians, family docs, OBGYNs. Um, and then we also think, of course, about parents and families. Um, so one of the things that this group really talked about is it's important to have resources directed towards each different audience. So what we're working on now is um, creating sort of a resource page for each one of the audiences that I mentioned that will also go with a webinar. Um, and the webinar will explain again what infant early childhood mental health is and then some of the resources that were um, um, 
that are available for you. And all of this will be homed on that first, uh, housed on this first link here, the Georgia Association of Infant Mental Health, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, but everybody save that web page because that's really going to be the hub of information in Georgia about workforce development, resources, um, free webinars, um, and we're really building that up. So right now, if you go to that website, you'll see some uh, a little bit of information. Um, by the end of the year, you're going to see a lot more of these resources. And we wanted to make sure in our slides today, we included all of these links because when you get the PDF of our slides, you can go back and click on all these links and do the research for yourself. Um, so Laura, go to the next slide. So you'll see that we have it separated out with parents and caregivers, next slide. And then also serve policy and advocates. Um, so all of this information will, again, by the end of the year be available on that Georgia AIM webpage, along with webinars that will explain a little bit more about infant early childhood mental health. Next slide. So the other thing that we're also, um, that's ongoing, that this group is working on is we really wanted to kind of get uh, out more regionally with this work um, and just not just talk at a state level about infant early childhood mental health. Um, and so what we decided to do is um, partner with Resilient Georgia, who some of you are familiar with, um, as they have the goal to build or expand trauma-informed communi communities across the state. So they have done a lot of work in the adolescent, young adult, um, area around trauma responsiveness and training. So what we wanted to do is really extend that to the zero to five workforce. So what we've done is invited the zero to five workforce into some of these coalitions, existing coalitions, and then offered training around community resilience model, CRIM trainings, and mindful self-compassion trainings, which is that sort of self-care uh, training for the zero to five workforce and leadership. Um, so hopefully some of you have heard about that or even maybe join some of those coalitions. They are available not everywhere in Georgia. We're working on that, um, but uh, most of Georgia. So reach out to your Resilient Georgia Coalition if you have not already to, um, to access these resources. And then also they worked in Savannah area um, on an early care resiliency zone guide that they're piloting for us um, for child care centers. Um, next slide. So you'll see that we've done a lot of work in promotion and prevention. And um, again, I'm doing very brief updates. There's a lot of other things going on too, um, because I wanted to get to the other work groups that we're doing. Um, so another important part of building the system is, as I mentioned earlier, the workforce. Um, so we really needed a dynamic leader um, for this work group. So we had our very own Callan Wells, who's, and I need to update this, the senior health policy manager at GEARS, Georgia Early Education Alliance for Ready Students. Um, and she's also a founding exploratory board member of the Georgia Association of Infant Mental Health, which again, we'll talk about because that's under one of our initiatives for workforce development. So Callan's been an advocate for, since the very beginning around infant early childhood mental health and had a um, big hand in the legislative study committee work. Um, so she and I have been working very closely um, trying to build the system of care along with our other partners. Um, so happy to have her. And also I should mention, um, Callan is actually, actually a national award winner as well. She's been recognized for this work by zero to three as the emergence, uh, emerging leader in infant early childhood mental health policy. So um, that's fantastic. And I'm so glad that Callan got that recognition. Um, but what is so great about that is that Georgia is doing big things in this area. Um, and Callan has um, thankfully led a lot of this work, but uh, we are really, the spotlight is on Georgia for some of this incredible uh, work that we've been able to accomplish during a pandemic and in a very short time. Uh, so let's talk about some of that. Next slide. <clears throat> So first of all, when we think about the workforce um, for the zero to five population, it's really um, comes from a lot of different experiences and education levels. So you've got child care providers, you've got home visitors, you've got early Head Start um, staff, you have uh, special education staff, but you also have like pediatricians and mental health um, clinicians and uh, child welfare Bear workers and um, folks in the justice system. So there's many different roles and experiences um, um, and education levels when you think about the early childhood uh, workforce. Next slide. So we really wanted to come up with something 
um, that we could really support the entire workforce because just working with pediatricians or just working with home visitors or just working with child care providers is not a system. Really working with all of those areas is what we need to do to build those rocks and that soil and so that we can have a real system, right, like in the first slide. So we knew that we needed to partner with the National Alliance of Infant Mental Health that provides or licenses the um, that's a global organization that um, provides licenses for the use of core competencies around infant early childhood mental health. And so that alliance, which is a global organization, um, licenses chapters for each state or entity um, to use and educate on those core competencies so that folks um, in the workforce can become endorsed. So we were very proud to form our own um, Georgia Association of Infant Mental Health Birth to Five um, Association. Um, we're very excited about this association because again, this will be the hub. This is what I was talking about. We'll have the resources, the free webinars, um, we really want to lift this up as where to go to if you need information about mental health and young children in Georgia. So you can read their mission um, and everything that we're working towards, but please save this web page because um, if you're in the workforce or a family or have any interest in um, mental health for young children, this is where we're going to um, lead everybody. Um, next slide. So to expand a little bit, what I'm talking about when I talk about endorsement is um, really sort of a certification for um, the workforce around those core competencies in infant early childhood mental health. What does each position or each role uh, need to know to be able to prom promote social emotional health um, for young children and their caregivers? So what we love about this endorsement process is there's a space uh, for everybody. Um, there's a space, there's an endorsement pathway for child care providers. There's an uh, endorsement pathway for mental health consultants or home visitors. Um, there's even an endorsement pathway for researchers or higher acad academic folks, um, uh, faculty. Um, so we are very excited um, to get started with this endorsement. I think we're the 32nd, 33rd, something like that state to um, start offering endorsements. So we're learning from our peers um, of how to do this. Uh, next slide, but we are excited to share more information through our Georgia AIM kickoff, which is going to be held in person November 2nd. Um, and the registration link will be in your uh, PDF slides. Um, but really with the focus of building the capacity of Georgia's infant early childhood workforce um, so that you can better support the wellness of young children and their families. If you're not able to attend the kickoff, again, just remember the um, web link and register, um, or, or I'm sorry, join the mailing list because any training announcements or information um, that Georgia AIM shares will be shared with their, their mailing list. Um, so please get involved with that. And um, we're just excited to have the opportunity to create this new organization. And I should also say that it's housed at, um, with Dr. Laura Wood at um, Georgia State University. Uh, next slide. So the other huge initiative that we have been working at um, on uh, with building the system is we really do sort of the prevention and promotion information um, that I just shared with you and Dr. Wood talked about. But some of the problem or really the biggest problem I think that that we heard from everyone is there's no providers. Like, you know, we know young children have trauma. Uh, we know we need resources. Uh, we know we need to refer these children to somewhere and these families somewhere, but there's nowhere that uh, we can send them that really specializes in infant mental health. Um, so we knew that we really had to back up and um, build the um, provider pool. Um, so through a relationship, um, with Gears in Alabama, um, we um, sort of adopted the evidence-based um, dyadic therapy model of child parent psychotherapy, which is also called CPP. And this is an evidence-based um, therapy model that includes, again, not just the child, never just the child, the child and the caregiver, that dyadic approach, which is essentially family therapy. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. 
um, to really address children who um, have experienced trauma, who are experiencing social emotional distress um, in, in early life, ages zero to five. So do not wait. If you have a child that you are working with who needs um, child parent psychotherapy, it is available not everywhere in Georgia, but I'll show you in just a second, we are trying to expand. Um, but this was very important for us to build the workforce that so you all have folks to refer to um, and experts in this field. Next um, slide. So as I mentioned, we started off with a pilot um, of having 15 slots in the areas of Atlanta, um, Macon and Athens. And at first we were just going um, through sort of the Babies Can't Wait program as a referral source, but then we were able to expand um, into receiving referrals from Head Start and, um, and other um, entities. Um, and through this pilot, we learned so much and were able to really hone in on the importance of not only training providers to be specialists in this pop for this population, but also to identify billing pathways and to really emphasize that dyadic treatment model when working with young children. So we'll talk about the uh, financing and policy in just a minute, but this pilot is really sort of the foundation of how we were able to get to where we are today. So where we are today, is that DECAL and the Department of Public Health actually um, funded a large cohort of CPP training um, that is hosted uh, by the Georgia State University Georgia AIM program. Um, and they, we have uh, about 60 clinicians being trained right now that will be um, able to take referrals in the fall. Um, and so, and then also through this and through Georgia Ames relationships, um, there was also a United Way grant in uh, Northeast Georgia that was able to train, I think about 20 um, new CPP cl clinicians. So our goal again, is to support access for families across the state to build, to, um, to be able to receive CPP. Um, next slide. So you'll see um, Callan created this map and we're very proud of it. When we first started out with CPP, uh, you could probably maybe if you were in Douglas County, um, get a CPP provider because there was a previous training cohort many years ago. Um, so maybe if you're in Metro Atlanta and you knew about CPP, you could maybe get some services. Now, after this training um, that is happening right now with the 60 clinicians, um, you can see that we were very um, deliberate about spreading out the uh, regions where these folks served. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do. Um, as you can see with the sort of shading here, the light blue really represents to just one or a few more um, clinicians per county. So um, just having one or two clinicians per county is of course not, um, where we want to be. And um, of course, we have a lot of work to do in um, the southeast uh, counties of Georgia. And we are currently um, figuring out funding sources and um, trying to get a cohort of training going there. So if any of you live um, there, we are working on that. Um, but like I said, these clinicians will be available for um, referrals soon, and all of this information will be available on the Georgia AIM webpage. So make sure that you um, bookmark that. Uh, next slide. So the other big thing that we are doing in workforce development is really promoting the use of the DC zero to five, um, which is a diagnostic um, tool that is designed to help professionals in the mental health field really recognize mental health and developmental challenges in infants and young children through five years old. Many of you might be um, familiar with the DSM-5 um, or the ICD-10. Those are other tools that are out there that are currently used um, with, with children and adults. Um, but we would recommend that with a child um, from zero to five, that this tool is what you use. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about a crosswalk that we're working on um, in policy and finance. Um, but this is basically um, a more age appropriate process in working with young children that really brings relationships um, into sort of the process of when you're assessing what a child needs. And again, 
uh, as Dr. Woods said, the child really doesn't exist with, um, out of the context of the relationship that they have with their primary caregiver. So um, you absolutely have to factor that in um, as well as um, psychosocial environmental uh, stressors um, when thinking about what a young child needs um, as far as intervention and diagnostic uh, processes. So uh, we have been promoting through Georgia AIM two different types of training around the DC-05. We have our clinical overview training, which just talks about what DC-05 is. Um, and then we also have um, the clinical training for actual practitioners of how to use the DC-05, which includes case studies. Um, so uh, you will do, we are actually funding another round of these trainings. So again, if you are interested in these, uh, stay tuned to that Georgia AIM web page um, because uh, DECAL is paying for these trainings so that we can educate folks in the DC-05. Uh, next slide. I keep trying to advance the slides myself and it is not working. <laughs> um, so that brings us to the policy and finance work group. And this is another, um, all the work groups are very important, but I think one of the biggest barriers, um, again, besides workforce that we heard about is that, okay, like I can provide the service now, but how do I pay for it? How do I bill? Are the policies around obtaining the services aren't, um, accessible to me. Um, so we really needed sort of a dream team of leadership um, for the policy and finance work group. So we're able to recruit uh, Wendy White Ty Green, who's the director of Office of the Medicaid Co Coordination and Health System Innovation um, from DBHDD, and then Melinda Ford Williams, who the, who's the pediatric service manager for DCH. And uh, this leadership has been phenomenal, and we have really uh, broken down some barriers when it comes to policy and finance and, and getting uh, young children's services. Because again, it doesn't matter if we train a whole big um, you know, workforce around infant early childhood mental health if you can't bill for it or you can't access those services. Um, so this is what this group was focused on. Next slide. Um, so in the wisdom of the House um, Study Committee, they made a lot of recommendations around policy and finance. So I've listed them um, here for you just so you can kind of see that there are really a lot of specific recommendations in this work um, from that committee. And the little check marks sort of indicate sort of where we are on each of these. So I'm really proud to say that we've touched each one of these, of uh, some of these sort of completely checking it off and some of them um, kind of working towards uh, that goal. Next slide. So this slide, and I won't spend too much time on this, but I just really wanted everybody to kind of see that um, in these blue sort of stairs right here are all of the recommendations um, from the study committee. Um, and uh, the green sort of stair steps are sort of where we are sort of next steps of, of, of where we're going with this. So one of the first things was just to start talking, right? Um, convening meetings with state Medicaid, which is DCH, to discuss reimbursement for behavioral health services for children, specifically um, the ages of birth to four, um, because there's already some things in place for um, five-year-olds or four-year-olds with diagnoses. So that was sort of the age range that we were looking at for policy and finance. Um, so even just by having DCH and DBHDD in a room with folks like myself and Callen um, and Georgia State University, um, just talking about some of the gaps and some of the um, things that we need to uh, work on to open these billing pathways uh, was an achievement in itself. Um, so then the next ask was really documentation of where behavioral health services are not covered for children in ages birth to four in the Medicaid state plan. And what we really found um, through this is that we just really needed to clarify um, billing practices um, or pathways um, for young children. So what we did is we created an online digital toolkit um, that we're still building, um, but one of the products that we have, and I'll show you a, um, a picture of it in just a second, is sort of a Medicaid uh, services map um, for um, the birth to five population, where it really lists out what services can 
can be provided and what ages are covered. Um, and that is located right now on the, Callan just posted it on the Medicaid webpage. So you can go to it right now and um, really get some very specific information about what is covered um, for what ages and what billing pathway that they're in. In fact, Laura, can you go on and go to the next slide and then we'll go back. So here's what it looks like. Um, so it will have all the billing pathways listed and then all the covered benefits. And then right below that, it talks about the age that is covered. And what we were able to really clarify is that care management organizations can provide dyadic type treatments like family therapy for the zero to three population. So um, most children in Georgia are covered by a care management organization. So that means that most children in Georgia would have access to family therapy. And again, that is the evidence-based sort of um, appropriate um, intervention there or treatment there is that sort of family therapy approach. Okay, if you can go back, where's Laura? Thank you so much. Um, so in that, so we were able to clarify that and that document is something you can go grab right now and print out and look at, but really when we, um, first shared that we really felt like, well, we need to go a next step further and really sort of, um, define who can bill for, uh, which services and what those codes are. So that's what we're working on right now in the policy and finance work group, which takes us to the next step here. Um, and we're really trying to map out um, billing pathways specifically, including the codes. Um, so we hope to add that to the toolkit, the online toolkit on DCH's website um, uh, before the end of the year. Um, and I'll also show you a picture of what that looks like in just a second. We're also working to add family therapy codes and some of the billing pathways. Um, so not just individual um, billing codes, but that family approach, that dyadic approach. Um, and then the next thing that we're working on that we're really excited about is that um, we have completed a DC zero to five crosswalk. Um, and what that means is we've talked about what the DC zero to five is. So um, we have the DC zero to five diagnos diagnoses listed, and then they are crosswalked with the ICD-10 DSM-5 as well. But the ICD-10 is how Medicaid um, bills in Georgia. So you can take an age appropriate process and diagnostic um, or diagnosis um, and then crosswalk it with a code that is billable in Medicaid and Georgia. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in just a second too. A lot of other states have adopted their own crosswalk and are already using it. So this is big news for Georgia. Um, and we've actually been already nationally recognized um, by the Centers for Medicaid um, for actually even starting to work on this. So we're very proud of that. And again, that will be added to the toolkit hopefully uh, in the next couple of weeks, um, but definitely before the end of the year. Um, so this, um, this work has been incredible. We have made a lot of strides in this work and really just sort of broken down a lot of barriers for people to have access and gain reimbursement from Medicaid um, for family therapy for young children. Um, and then also a legislator, I'll mention that the, one of the recommendations was a plan for Medicaid to cover the mother of 12 months after birth for the child for, for Medicaid. So, um, oh, am I over time? I'm over time. Okay, so I'll skip over that. That was approved as well. Um, next slide. Um, so this is just an example of the billing document with the codes. Next slide. And then this is an example of what the crosswalk will look like with the um, DC zero to five diagnoses and then the ICD, uh, ICD 10 uh, codes. And then with that, I'm sorry, I went over time. I will let Callan take over. That's okay, Laura. Um, it's a lot of, as, as y'all can see, it's a lot of work. And um, especially the Medicaid work is really in depth. And Laura, I don't know if you've been following the chat, but a lot of folks are really excited that Medicaid is covering these services. Um, and again, Georgia AIM really um, is going to be the hub for supporting um, clinicians in a lot of this work. So we really recommend that y'all um, get on the Georgia AIM uh, mailing list, um, you know, get in touch with Georgia AIM. Um, so I get to come in and talk about 
recommendations and sort of the future, which is always really great and really exciting um, to be, you know, given the opportunity to really plan and think ahead. Um, and so, you know, we've done a lot of work to um, carry out the study committee recommendations, which have really served as a roadmap for us for the last four years or three years since the study committee. Um, but we're in a position now where we really get to look to the future and sort of chart um, new territory um, and think about how do we really grow this work and continue to support children and families and all 280 of you are partners in that work. Um, so in terms of prevention, um, we think that um, high quality early childhood education is a really important factor uh, piece in the infant and early childhood mental health work um, because we know that early childhood education really gives children a safe, stable environment. Um, this also overlaps with the Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Plan, which recommends high quality early childhood education be accessible and affordable to families. Um, we, we believe um, that evidence-based home visiting is also um, part of our spectrum of services and um, support you know, increased access to evidence-based home visiting across the state. Um, we want to continue to provide training on early childhood trauma to members of the child serving workforce. And we know that Georgia AIM is going to play a really big role in that. Um, and again, when we say child serving workforce, we don't just mean, you know, mental health clinicians who serve young children. We mean this really broad range of professionals who are interacting with young children, including early childhood educators, home visitors, uh, babies can't wait professionals, et cetera. Um, we believe Georgia can support the workforce in getting endorsed by Georgia AIM. And again, endorsement really serves on top of any professional licensure to really show um, you know, it, additional expertise in infant mental health and early childhood mental health um, to, to really say you know, this professional has gone kind of above and beyond um, their professional license to really focus on the mental health needs of young children and families. And then all of us can play a role in promoting the understanding that safe, nurturing relationships and experiences promote social emotional well being. Um, so, all the things that Laura, Dr. Wood talked about at the beginning of this presentation, we want everybody to be sharing that information with everybody in their networks. Um, and there are a lot of initiatives um, that are working on that as well, including Better Brains for Babies, um, which was also mentioned in the chat. Next slide, Laura. In terms of treatment, um, you know, we talked a lot about child parent psychotherapy and we showed that map 120 counties have access. Um, that's not 159 counties. We have 159 counties in Georgia. We wanna make sure every single county has access to caregiver child therapy um, and that caregiver child therapy is affordable and accessible across the state um, which means we need more than just one clinician serving, you know, eight counties. We need multiple clinicians in each county. So um, we really want to continue to grow the capacity for caregiver child therapy in Georgia. Um, we believe in addressing parents' mental health and substance use concerns because we know that this is affecting young children. Um, we believe that treatment for parents should include children that children should have an opportunity to join their caregivers and that when they, when caregivers need their own time, that childcare should be provided for, um, for parents so that they can, you know, meaningfully engage in their own treatment. Um, and we believe that this treatment should be accessible and where families are. Um, so in their homes, in NICUs, in community service boards, in the court systems, we want this understanding that um, there are these caregiver child therapies that attachment is important, that children should be included, et cetera, to be really understood in all of these different environments. Um, we believe Georgia should enact policies that support caregivers who are experiencing stress. So Laura Wood talked about not only do children need support for the attachment, but the whole family needs support to alleviate stress. And this can be related to housing and income support. Um, and so we really need policies in place that really give families what they need so that they can focus on their children. Um, and that Georgia should really consider case management services um, as part of our system of care. 
And then last, we talked about this, but ensuring Medicaid reimbursement for both prevention and treatment and services, um, and that these services really need to, need to include children and their caregivers together, that this is really important for children under five, and I would argue for children over five too. Um, so, so again, wanting to ensure that those um, services are reimbursable and at a rate that clinicians can really um, provide the services um, in, a, in a meaningful way. So thank you all so much. I know we went over time. We can stay on a little longer if you guys have any questions, um, but I know a lot of no. people have to drop off. <laughs> Sorry, I read that. Thank you so much, um, Laura, Laura, and Kaylin. We also have all of their speaker profiles and we have their email addresses listed in the speaker profiles. And I also just relisted that Georgia AIM um, opening launch event in our live feed in our chat discussion. So you guys can find it even after this event and after we close out today. Um, they're going to send over their slides, which will be posted um, later today or tomorrow on our website as well. So we really appreciate you guys' time and tune in tomorrow. Kayla is coming back to present on the mental health parity bill and what that means for families in Georgia. So thank you everyone. And we'll see you at the next session.